region and chennai chapter through microsoft teams platform before we get started we request the uh, participants to kindly mute your microphones please do not switch on the microphone before, uh, during the time of the presentation it causes a lot of trouble and uh, disturbance so you requesting you to please mute your microphones during the presentation and you may unmute yourself at the end of the uh, session and the questions may be asked to the uh, speaker i request you all to kindly cooperate also requesting you all to please put your uh, cameras off except for the speaker all of our cameras can be off so that uh, we can have a better coverage of the presentation and just the speaker yeah so to get things started we now request mr dg benakappa honorary secretary iif southern region to welcome the gathering please so thank you vignesh yes sir Thanks. uh good afternoon everybody it's a proud uh, pleasure uh, to welcome you all for the topic on causes and cures for typical metallurgical defects in gray and ductile cast iron by southern region in association with chennai chapter so sabal i would like to welcome mr kumar kistle head research and innovations elkem for uh, wonderful presentation online welcome we welcome you kumar sir kumar sir is online yes sir thank hey, you he is there he is there welcome welcome you for the nice presentation in pipeline sir welcome you once again and also i welcome all the participants from uh, all the chapters of southern region welcome you for the technical uh, presentation hope this will help a lot of foundries because Uh, metallurgical defects are the major contributors for the rejection itself so this session will be a eye opener and uh, i i saw a lot of people uh, as a team sitting together to view the technical session we welcome you all and uh, also welcome uh, chairman chennai chapter sakti sakti vel sir videsh ramanan and muthu kumar sir in uh, his absence i think he is busy with some other work also yeah, welcome you all for the program end of the program i request everybody to give the feedback also so that it becomes helpful for the chapters and uh, chennai chapter and sr to get the program betterment thank you thank you uh, benaka pasad uh, to now introduce our speaker for the day we now request mr r pani murugan on the treasurer iif southern region to introduce the speaker to the gathering please good afternoon uh, fellow foundry men i have immense pleasure in introducing the speaker of the today's uh, webinar mr kumar kisle he is an iit banaras hindu university metallurgy alumnus with more than 12 years of experience in the field of metal treatment and foundry metallurgy currently working with uh, elcom south asia private limited as a head research and innovation speaker he is involved with uh, several modern techniques as well as innovations in the manufacturing of metal treatment of alloys for the iron industry the speaker has special interest in the field of metal solidification thermal analysis and metal treatment with several research publications and seminars and webinars conducted on the mentioned topics the speaker brings in rich knowledge of cast iron foundry metallurgy in this session in fact in this occasion i would like to recollect the, the previous webinar conducted by mr kumar kisle was well attended by the lot of foundry men i think which was a very knowledgeable one so i hope this uh, this also will be a another uh, knowledge sharing this thing experience for the fellow foundry men i will i introduce i am uh, giving the floor to mr kumar kisle. yeah thank you so uh, yeah I, it has been introduced uh, the topic for today's seminar is causes and cures of typical metallurgical defect in cast iron uh, it's a vast topic uh, i have about an hour and 10 minutes maybe for the presentation uh, so i will try to be a bit brief uh, of course we can take up uh, discussions or topics towards the end of the session or later when we have time so uh, there are a lot of defects uh, which we encounter on a day to day basis i am not touching upon every one but uh, some of the common defects that we get and then uh, there would be some some indicators on how to you know uh, address those uh, causes what can be the root cause for those uh, defects and then how to 
solve it. It's it's more of a generic uh, uh, presentation because, uh, like we all know, each foundry is different, and uh, each foundry can have a different set of uh, process parameters and conditions under which the casting is produced. So uh, when we try to solve or uh, you know find the uh, solution to a problem or a defect, uh, we have to consider everything. So uh, what I would uh, say that uh, in this presentation, there would be some guidelines uh, which we will have to see how much of it suits or matches our foundry condition and what all can be implemented. So with that thought, I would uh, start the presentation today. I guess we can take up uh, queries or uh, discussions towards the end of the presentation. Uh, that would be uh, right after we finish this uh, this presentation. Yeah. So I start uh, the basic. Uh, there are only about three things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, there will be a very small brief about the cast iron, uh, and then uh, some typical metallurgical defects, uh, beginning with uh, gray iron first, and then duct iron towards the later part of the presentation. Yeah. So we know about cast iron. We have all been into this industry, and this is not something which is new. It has been there since the 6th century BC. Uh, of course, the kind of iron being produced at that point of time and the grade of iron and also the quality of the product which has been produced back then was much inferior to what and how we do it today. Uh, it was it was basically towards the uh, middle of the 20th century. Then uh, when we actually uh, began to really see good quality cast irons being coming into the industry which had much better properties and much better, you know, uh, uh, much better quality compared to what was done in the past. Uh, of course, ductile iron as such is something which is uh, much newer compared to gray iron. Uh, we had uh, the, the, you know, beginning of ductile iron production, uh, production sometime around the World War II, that was in the 1940s. And, and that's when, uh, after which the, the graphite, which was initially earlier in the form of flakes, were gradually converted into something which was more spherical in shape, uh, which is nodular iron, ductile iron, which gave us much better, you know, uh, properties and uh, mechanical properties, especially uh, compared to the earlier gray irons being produced. But then, of course, we did not stop just by producing ductile iron. The industry came up with with much more advanced forms, grades uh, of of these iron, which were uh, complementing and which were also uh, produced or developed to meet the uh, the, the ever-growing application and, and, and the ever-growing requirements of the industry. One of such was the production of uh, CG iron, which is nothing but uh, uh, a midway or a mix of both gray iron and ductile iron. Just to tell you why uh, gray iron is different from ductile iron, of course, we can see it from these. I would take up the pointer. Yeah. So. Uh, if you look at these three microstructures, these are these. This one on the on the left of your screen is gray iron, uh, which are, which is uh, which can clearly be seen by uh, by uh, by looking at the visual graphite flakes. The graphite is in the form of flakes, and like you say, these are graphite flakes with very sharp ends, and these sharp ends of the flake can act as a crack initiator. So the crack initiation happens on these pointed graphite flake ends which results in a much lower mechanical strength or in a much lower tensile strength of the casting. On the other hand, you see these ductile iron uh, microstructure where the graphite which is present is in, is in the form of spheres or mostly spheres and the, the, sphere, the sphericity, the roundness of it is nodularity like we all know. So how is it different from gray iron? Because if you look at it from this in this particular photograph, you can see that there are cracks but these cracks get arrested because they do not have a very smooth flow towards the other end of the graphite flake. So what you can see here, the, the graphite the, the graphite flake actually acts as a crack initiator or a crack propagator. In this case, the graphite which is present does not act as a crack propagator and it kind of arrests the movement of this crack, thereby giving a much better mechanical strength, a much better tensile strength to the casting. And then because it takes some time before it actually allows the crack to propagate and that is the period where the elongation happens or the or the casting becomes longer before it breaks. That's the a very crude way of telling what does elongation mean. So this is why the ductile iron castings also have some percentage elongation or the change in uh, its shape before it actually breaks. 
which gives it a better mechanical strength that is uh, tensile strength as well as a better uh, ductility that is the elongation the percentage elongation of it now uh, we did not stop there of course we tried to form a kind of iron or, or a kind of a, a casting which should have a combined impact or effect of both types of iron and that is what cg iron is with a controlled amount of uh, magnesium with a control very controlled treatment where we do have flakes but we, they have rounded ends and we also have some graphite so it can have you know cg iron can be of different uh, uh, grades with a with the nodularity of anywhere between you know 15% 20% 30% or so so it will not be like 85 90 at ductile iron and it will also not be zero like gray iron so it will be somewhere in between and thereby what does it do it gives you uh, a strength which is higher than gray iron and it gives you a uh, and it gives you a conductivity which is get better than gray iron so both these all the three kinds of iron do find application depending upon the type of casting that we are making and the type of requirement that we have from that particular casting with this uh, uh, i move to the next part of the presentation so first, like I mentioned, we would be taking up gray iron. So uh, we will begin with the some of the typical defects, some typical metallurgical defects. I am going to focus this presentation or this session just on the metallurgical defects. Of course, as a foundryman, we know there can be many other kind of defects related to sand, etc., the mold and all. But today we are going to focus only only on the metallurgical aspects or the metallurgical defects in the uh, gray and ductile iron. So I will be taking one after the other. So there will be about uh, 10 defects each in both gray and ductile. And then we would see the final conclusion, right? So to begin with, the first defect that we talk of is hydrogen pinhole. Uh, hydrogen pinhole, uh, actually pinholes are something which is very interesting. Uh, just by the look of it, just by, uh, you know, uh, looking at the casting, we as foundry men do sometimes confuse between what the defect actually is is it blowhole is it is it something related to gas it is some is it something related to slag is it porosity shrinkage so there can be so many different inferences or observations which can be made once you look at the defect in a casting but then how do we identify how do we you know uh, differentiate between different types of uh, gas defects is is uh, uh, is what we are going to see today so uh, hydrogen pinhole as such are not something which is completely round and smooth so they can have some amount of you know oxidation they can have some amount of roughness in the surface so so that is something which is a which is a beginning of the you know the initial indicator on what does a how can you you know uh, classify a pinhole as a hydrogen pinhole of course uh, this this type of a pinhole can be found in both gray and ductile iron. It does appear to be a small spherical hole and may not be present on the casting surface, but it would be present just below the casting surface in most cases and uh, can be revealed while during machining, sectioning, etc. Uh, the, the, the inside of the hole, you know, the, the graph, when, when you look at the, the that particular pinhole under a microscope, you would see a very blackish and shiny structure, which is because of the uh, you know precipitation of graphite or the deposition of graphite on that layer. And then also the other important indicator of graphite pinhole is that when you look at the micrograph after polishing around the this particular pinhole, we can also see some of the regions which is completely devoid of graphite. So you would not see any graphite flake as such near or adjacent, just adjacent to the uh, pinhole uh, uh, area that you have. So that is one of the indicators of hydrogen pinhole. How do you resolve it? But before resolution, we need to understand where does it come from? So it does come from one of the main parameters which, which uh, uh, causes hydrogen pinhole is the excess moisture in the sand or the sand system. Of course, not just the sand, also excess moisture or presence of moisture in the coatings or the refractories or any such part of the sand mold, uh, any such part of the mold which is direct in contact with the with the iron or the casting. So what do we need to do? We need to uh, reduce the percentage or, or make sure that we do not have excess moisture in our sand, in our refractories, in our coatings that we have, and they are sufficiently dried before they, we put them into use. We have to also try and see how we, do we reduce the aluminum and the titanium content, because in the presence of high aluminum, hydrogen pinhole tendency becomes more. 
And of course, when you have the gas, you have to make sure that you make sufficient provision to ensure that the gas escapes and does not get trapped within the uh, within the cavity of the mold. And that is why we have to also see whether our venting process or the venting design or the vent locations are sufficient and strategically placed so that you take care of all the gas which is uh, uh, which is emitted should somehow escape out of the cavity when the mold figuring is happening. So these can, this can be done for the hydrogen pinhole. Uh, this is just an indicator. You can see uh, this is a photograph taken using a SEM, a scanning electron microscope. And this is how the, uh, the hydrogen pinhole, the inner cavity of the hydrogen pinhole appears to be at a higher magnification and at a depth of focus. You can see the black shiny part inside and you can also see some amount of graphite being depleted around it. And that is a clear indicator of a hydrogen pinhole. Of course, when you have a less percentage of aluminium and less percentage of titanium, the risk of hydrogen pinhole is much lesser compared to when you have a higher aluminium and a higher titanium in the system. So, so a control on titanium more importantly and a control on aluminium is important to make sure that we have good control on the hydrogen pinhole. Sources for aluminium and titanium, titanium can come in from your raw materials. Titanium can come in from your, uh, you know, ferrosilicon sources. Titanium can, titanium can come in from your scrap or the returns and aluminium aluminium can come in one from your steel so steel scrap and also it can come in from the ferroalloys that you use you know you, you could be using high aluminium containing uh ferrosilicon ferro manganese or even inoculants and ferrosilicon magnesium so the aluminium sources and the titanium sources needs to be controlled to reduce the risk for hydrogen pinhole in the system the second part another interesting part of it is the nitrogen blue hole so this is not something which is which will be as smooth and rounded as a as as other gas defects. You will have more of a fissure kind of a defect, and this fissure kind of a defect can be something uh, very severe. So, uh, which means it could be present in the entire part of the casting, or it could also be present in a small area. So that is again depend on the type of casting design, the solidification behavior of the casting, and of course the percentage of nitrogen that is present in your system. So if you, if you look at it, you have you have some of the defects on the surface and then some of the nitrogen fissures, uh, you know, continuing all the way inside less than uh, uh, inside up to about 20, 30 mm from the surface of the casting. So you can have nitrogen porosity or this nitrogen uh, fissure kind of a defect way inside the casting, which could be a continuation from the surface. So when we section or when we machine the casting or when we drill, uh, a casting, uh, there is a strong possibility of this nitrogen fissure defect to be more uh, visible. Uh, the photograph on the right uh, shows how the uh, nitrogen fissure defect looks like in a in a scan under a scanning electron microscope. It's it's taken as a much lower uh, magnification, somewhere around 50x, and you can see how the region around this is also depleted of the uh, graphite flakes. So th there is a rim of graphite, uh, there is a rim of austenitic matrix which does not have any graphite flakes around it. And of course, the surface and the shape of the defect will not be smooth. It will be more of a fissure than a uh, blue hole. Characteristics, uh, mostly common in case of gray iron. Uh, and uh, it would be, it would be uh, found in the uh, heavier section. So in normally, the thin section, small casting, fast solidifying casting does not have usually does not have nitrogen uh, defects, but the medium to heavy sections, which has core especially, or the resin bonded mold can does have a much higher tendency or propensity for the nitrogen blue holes. The fissures, they are uh, irregularly shaped cavities and which are mostly perpendicular to the surface can go all the way into the casting. Possible cures, uh, we have to control the uh, incoming nitrogen into the system. Where does the nitrogen come from? It can come from the materials in the charge, especially, and uh, also the recarburizers that we use in the system. How do we solve it? Uh, we can have a much higher carbon equivalent. What does it do? It ensures that you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of uh, graphite precipitation and thus restricts the uh, fissure defect from uh, you know, flowing into the cavity. Of course, we can also use uh, titanium or zirconium to tie up the excessive nitrogen. Titanium as such does have its own uh, problems which it comes with. So titanium may not be a very feasible solution for nitrogen, especially in today's world where we do not want titanium in our system. 
So the other option could be to use zirconium. Uh, we have seen a lot of zirconium containing inoculants being used by foundries when they face this kind of a fissure defect. But that's kind of a solution to the problem which has already occurred. If we do not want the problem to happen, then uh, a better way of doing it is to control the, uh, you know, uh, incoming nitrogen, which could be coming from the charge material or from the recarburizers. Thereby, uh, there can be all other ways of doing it. Like I mentioned, how do we control the incoming nitrogen into the system by using uh, binders and resin system, which does not have enough nitrogen and also by ensuring that we have sufficient vent so that whatever nitrogen does come into the system is allowed a, a free path to you know, escape out of the cavity. The third defect uh, is the slag defect, something which is very uh, common and, and we do find this kind of a defect in in foundries where we do not have uh, either one uh, a very good way of removing slag or two too many factors which are contributing to the generation of slag this slag can be on the surface uh, this slag can also go along with the liquid metal inside the inside the cavity of the casting so thereby uh, it can either cause inclusion defect that is slag and sometimes this slag can also emit gases so the slag uh, defect or the slag inclusion defect is in in many cases also uh, uh, does come in combined with the gas uh, related defects in the casting. Possible cures, the first uh, first and the foremost, we have to improve the process of removal of the slag. The slag removal process should be as late as possible so that you are able to remove any slag which is generated before the before the casting. And uh, you thereby also take care of the slag which comes in from the furnace, the slag which comes in during magnesium treatment, the slag that comes in uh, with the, you know, uh, with the with the inoculant or any other additives. Like say, for example, people do add alloys into the ladle before casting to to get better recoveries, and there could be a tendency for slag generation from those additions. So, and of course, because our ladles, if they are open, they would be in contact with the atmospheric uh, oxygen, which would increase the tendency or the possibility of slag generation. Uh, we do also should look at uh, reducing turbulence of the metal because more turbulence means more metal getting exposed to the atmosphere and more metal getting exposed to the atmosphere would mean more oxidation and thereby more slag. Use of filters, making sure that you have sufficient, uh, you do not have a very high uh, operating temperatures because high operating temperatures means higher rate of oxidation and thereby higher slag. Use uh, all the alloys which has got a lower melting point so that, so that you do not have these uh, these additives acting as a you know coagulators for the slag and thereby also make sure that there is a fast dissolution of all the additives before the metal goes into the cavity. Uh, Adding anything, let's say, just giving as one of the examples, avoid adding silicon carbide as the late stage of processing because silicon carbide as such has got a lot of impurities. Uh, a commercially available silicon carbide has about 15% of impurity into it. And all these impurities are very high temperature melting. Uh, they have a very high temperature melting properties. Therefore, they can stay as a undissolved and can appear as a slag into the casting. So basically what happens, the metal oxide can combine with the carbon to form metal and carbon oxides, which does try to escape as a gas, thereby giving you a slag inclusion defect as well as a gas defect. So in many cases, the slag inclusion is combined with gas defects into the casting and thereby it becomes difficult to identify whether the problem is related to slag or it is just related to gas. So we have seen a lot of cases where the foundries have started to look at gas defects and try to find solution to it when the actual problem was the slag which was getting entrapped within the uh, the casting and was actually the reason for the gas defect. We have been through this. We have seen uh, uh, the characteristics of slag blowhole as such, segregation of manganese sulfide, clouds of, cloud of manganese sulfide particles, which can be visible around the blowhole. Uh, of course, it will always be connected to the actual slag which is present inside the casting, so it can be traced the way into the slag inclusion whenever we have a slag blowhole in the system. How do we resolve it? Sorry? No. So how do we resolve it? Uh, we use screen ladders. So we make sure that our 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 metal handling systems, uh, metal handling vessels are always clean. 
We make sure that we have a good control on the manganese and the sulfur in case of gray iron. We make sure that we have a very efficient slag skimming and removal process and should happen as late as possible so that you are able to take away any slag which is generated during the system while melting, while additions and during transfer. Uh, like I said, you need to have a control. This, this goes in general for any kind of defect in cast iron that we have to uh, make sure that our temperatures are sufficient and our temperatures are uh, at as per the requirement of the casting and we should not go either too high or too low when it comes to the uh, to, to the operating temperatures. We also have to design our casting and our methoding and gating system in such a manner that you do not have turbulence or, the, or you do not have uh, turbulence when the metal flows from the down sprue into the running system to the in gates and into the casting so that you do not get any uh, any kind of turbulence thereby you do not have any uh, you know uh, excessive metal and atmosphere interaction and thereby you do not have much of oxidation use of filters is is definitely one of the solutions to uh, resolve or control uh, slag inclusion into the casting but sometimes filters are not sufficient because the slag can be uh, a bit viscous and liquid slag in the beginning and thereby it does have the tendency to pass through the filters. So the, just having the filters alone may not always give you 100% solution to the problem. We have to also make sure that our systems are uh, taken care of before it goes into the gating system. Carbides, again, one of the uh, major problems, something which, which causes uh, a lot of uh, machinability, shrinkage, uh, and mechanical property issues inside the casting. Grain boundary carbides, carbides which are uh, caused mostly because of presence of carbide promoting elements, very fast solidification of the casting, insufficient inoculation, etc. etc. What we are trying to show here is like, like if you look at it, this if you look at this microscope, you uh, microstructure uh, using a SEM, you can see some amount of carbides, free carbides present. And when we tried to do a chemical analysis of those, we were able to find high high percentage of molybdenum, chromium, vanadium, etc. So these are, like we have always said, are the actual carbide promoting elements and thereby wherever you see carbides is actually coming from because of these elements. How do you, how do you solve it? What can be the possible cure for carbides? The possible cure, one of it, the most primary of it is to ensure that we have control over the carbide promoting elements. Most of the common carbide promoting elements, the one of the most common ones in case of gray iron is chromium, which we do add sometimes to achieve the mechanical properties, but excessive chromium is always uh, at disadvantages for the castings. We have to make sure that we have control on these trace elements. We have to make sure that we, we uh, have a control on the rate of solidification. So fast solidification means less time for the carbon to come out as graphite. And when there is less time of carbon to come out as graphite, it will con combine with iron to form iron carbides. And that is the uh, that is the phase which we do not want in, your, in our castings. Uh, we have to, of course, improve inoculation if, 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 if that is one of the solutions. We need to use better high potent inoculants, especially for the critical castings, to make sure that the graphitization potential is improved and whatever carbon is to come out, it should come out as graphite. We have to uh, have a control on our system, uh, meaning that we do, we do need to control on the superheat. We do not want to uh, heat the metal to such a high temperature that its nucleating potential goes down. And we also have to make sure that we do not cast or melt for a longer time where thereby the inoculant fades and you have a carbidic tendency. Uh, not something which I'm a fan of. Heat treatment can be done to control carbides, but that is something which we, we should try and avoid. One, because it is an expensive process, and two, because we have much better ways of controlling carbides rather than going for a heat treatment once the carbide is generated. <coughs> Sorry. Next one is steadite. Steadite is uh, iron phosphide, which can be present in the thick as well as the thin section, but it is more common in the thick section of gray iron castings. What are steadites? Steadites are uh, iron phosphides which are present as clusters in the grain boundaries. When you have a higher phosphorus percentage, these steadite eutect uh, phosphide eutectic or steadite eutectics, they, so they uh, try and accumulate near the grain boundaries and uh, give you a poor machinability. Some, in some of the cases, uh, in case of gray iron, where you, where you need wear resistance, some foundries do add phosphorus 
to get the steroids but then it is very important that you have steroids present as a network throughout the casting and not segregate to one or two locations or a few locations where they can form iron phosphide eutectic which is again like i said in the previous slide heat treatment does help in uh, you know resolving the carbide issues but even because these uh, phosphide eutectic solidify at 950 degrees also heat treatment also cannot get rid of the steroids so steroid as such becomes a much bigger problem and a headache for a foundry man compared to carbides how do you control it uh, you control it by reducing the phosphorus content that is number 1 and if definitely number 2 by improving inoculation you have a much higher number of uh, grain boundaries so that you have even if you get steroid they should be uniformly distributed and we do not have uh, too much of graphite uh, or too much of steroid segregation causing problems to our casting uh, a combination of uh, undercooled graphites we have uh, this is one of the most common defects that we witness in our foundries and we have also classified them as you know type b which is the rosette uh, you can see this rosette kind of a structure here type e where you have a much pronounced graphite uh, uh, dendrite structure and very less of graphite precipitation precipitating around it and then type d where it is undercooled and directionally solidified but you have a much higher uh, graphite precipitation in in case of a type d matrix why do you have undercooled graphite because we have a much fast solidification rate and the, and the graphite does carbon does not have enough time to come out as graphite why does this happen uh, when we have higher superheating and when we have a very long holding time we definitely kill the graphitization potential and thereby the graphite coming out tendency goes down when we have too high titanium content which again uh, reduces the graphitization when we have a very poor carbon equivalent meaning that there is not enough uh, graphite to come out when we have insufficient inoculation and when we do not precondition the metal so these are some of the uh, uh, possible reasons due to which we get undercooled graphite how do you solve it uh, by reducing the solidification rate uh, it again depends on the type of casting it is not always possible especially when you are making thin section castings how do you reduce the solidification rate right but there can be some ways of doing it uh, like slowing down the rate of solidification to we need to definitely avoid the amount of superheat and the amount of uh, holding times that we have we have to control titanium and other such elements uh, like uh, which are which are uh, deleterious to graphitization we have to improve preconditioning inoculation and also choose a very sufficient and suitable carbon equivalent for the kind of casting that we are manufacturing the other alternate aspect of uh, graphitization is the type c graphite that is the kish graphite kish graphites are uh, coarse graphite flakes uh, like the one, like the one that you see here these are very really heavy and thick graphite flakes which are visible in the casting mostly when you have a very slow solidification rate due to which the carbon segregates in one or few of the locations and also two when you have a very high percentage of carbon equivalent so when you have a high carbon equivalent they have to go somewhere right so what they do they try and accumul accumulate and agglomerate at a particular location thereby increasing the thickness of these graphite flakes uh when you machine this kind of a casting which has type c you can see this type of pit marks which are basically graphite getting pulled out because of their concentration in few of the locations how do you resolve it uh, of course you have to choose the carbon equivalent uh, judiciously as per the section thickness you have to make uh, you have to somehow try and increase the rate of solidification by using chills or something so that you do not give the carbon sufficient time to agglomerate at one position you have to uh, improve the inoculation so that you create more number of nucleating sites for the graphite growth thereby distributing the amount of graphite in several locations and thereby also and like i mentioned we have to increase the graphitization potential one of the ways of doing it is by improving the sulfur content in the iron so when we increase in, increase the sulfur we get a much better graphitization and thereby you get a much better uh, uh, graphite structure vitamin statin a uh, very unique kind of a uh, uh, kind of a condition where the graphite flakes has spiky and a net kind of a structure around it it is not able to hold its shape of smooth or a or a or a linear graphite flake structure and this happens mostly because of the presence of lead in the casting 
or bismuth or antimony in the casting and where does it come from it's mo it mostly comes in from your charge materials because there is usually no other source for these elements to come in how do you resolve it the single and the foremost way to resolve it is by having a control on these trace elements in the casting next section uh, i guess i am not going very fast next section is the typical metallurgical defect in the ductile iron that's the second part of it again i'll start with the hydrogen pinholes uh, the hydrogen pinhole in ductile iron is a bit different from the one in case of gray iron here also you will you will find this kind of a structure just below the casting surface and also uh, you can see some amount of uh, graphite depleted regions around the structure uh, around the uh, the pinhole of course it will not be a very good rim like you see in case of a in case of a gray iron but you would see that the, the region around it would have much lesser percentage of graphite nodules compared to uh, uh, the other part which has got a much higher density of nodules how do you resolve it again the resolution is quite similar to gray iron uh, because the cause is similar we have to reduce the moisture uh, which is present either in the sand or in the refractory or in the coatings etc we have to reduce aluminum and titanium which does improve or or increase the tendency or the possibility of a hydrogen pinhole of course we have to find uh, you, have, you have to give sufficient way out for these gases and therefore what we need to do is we need to improve the venting or the vent arrangements that we have in the casting nitrogen blowhole in case of gray iron although nitrogen blowhole or this nitrogen fissure is a very uh, common defect in case of ductile iron it is quite rare why it is rare because you do have presence of magnesium and in in the presence of magnesium normally nitrogen fissure or nitrogen defect does not happen but in case of it cannot be completely ruled out you also have some rare occasions when you have nitrogen defect coming into the ductile iron castings as well how do you resolve it you you resolve it by making i mean why is it cost first it is caused uh, mostly in the same sections heavy section uh, casting which is close to the core or close to the resin bonded mold uh, it does have a, a much more smoother appearance compared to the gray iron nitrogen fissures so the gray iron fissures are much more sharp and irregular in in shape but it's much more smoother in case of ductile iron and it does have the same black shiny dendritic appearance inside but the dendrites will also not be as pronounced as you see in case of gray iron castings possible core, cure uh, very similar to what we have in the other case we have to reduce nitrogen content to less than 85 ppm and maybe about 100 and 120 ppm in case of thin sections and then uh, how do we do that we have to ensure that our nitrogen containing materials which are in the charge or in the recarburizers are controlled and we do not have a, enough or sufficient amount of nitrogen coming into the system uh, adding titanium or zirconium can be a solution to it titanium is a strict no no in case of ductile iron because it's an anti nodulizer and more titanium means your nodularity comes down so a zirconium based inoculant can be or even ferro zirconium for that matter can be a way out to control the amount of nitrogen fissure or nitrogen blowhole defects inside the casting slag it's it's a completely different ball game when it comes to ductile iron in case of ductile iron slag can be slag does have a much more tendency of formation because of uh, the most differentiating factor magnesium and the ferrosilicon magnesium treatment so there can be slag which can be caused during uh, melting and can come into the come into the system through the treatment ladle and there can be slag which is which is generated during the metal treatment because you have so much of reaction violence you have so much of turbulence you have so much of uh, interaction with the atmospheric uh, oxygen etc so thereby there is a strong tendency of uh, slag coming into the system plus one more thing here manganese sulfide the manganese and sulfur interaction which happens during during the magnesium treatment can also be one of the one of the causes of slag because this manganese sulfide slag can uh, if if we do not have a very efficient way of removing it can come into the system and this sulfur which comes in with magnesium can in fact in some cases result as flake 
structure around the slag inclusion, which tells you that there is some amount of sulfur which is present in the slag, which is causing the graphites to convert into flakes instead of nodules inside the casting. So if it's a manganese sulfide slag, then you will have a thin layer of graphite flakes next to the inclusion area. Uh, but if it is the other form of slag, which can be magnesium oxide or coming in from the furnace, you would not see so much of flake generation towards the uh, ne next to the inclusion area. Possible cures. Uh, the first possibility is definitely to make sure that we improve the slag removal. We have sufficient and a very effective way of removing the slag as late as possible before casting. Uh, we have to make sure that there is uh, uh, the, the ladders are clean or any because the slag has the tendency to float up and accumulate around the rim of the ladder where you have the metal coming in one after the other. So there, there is a strong possibility of this slag coming in from the previous treatment and getting along with the metal and going into the casting. So thereby we have to make sure that any vessel which is handling the liquid metal, be it the treatment ladle, be it the pouring ladle, be it even the tundish cover of the treatment ladle have to be very clean and there should not be any deposition of slag into it, which can eventually cause you inclusion or defects. We have to uh, make sure that the flow of metal is as smooth as possible and you do not have a lot of turbulence inside the gating system. Uh, in case of ductile iron, it becomes even more important to use the most suitable kind of filters because uh, these filters need to be designed in such a manner that any kind of slag, be it liquid slag or the, the solid ones, should not pass through the filters. We have to make sure that the metal treatment alloys that we use, be it ferrosilicon magnesium or inoculant, should be of such a composition that you do not have uh, excess slag contributing elements into it. For example, if you're using a high magnesium ferrosilicon magnesium, you would have a much higher, uh, you will have a much higher uh, uh, tendency for uh, uh, slag generation because higher magnesium means more turbulence, more reaction and thereby more slag generation. Same thing can be told about calcium and aluminium. So if your uh, so if your uh, if your metal has got uh, if your treatment alloys have got high aluminium and high calcium in the system, there can be a strong tendency of excessive slag generation in this. So thereby uh, we have to make sure that we choose our inoculants and ferrosilicon magnesiums in such a manner that they should not be causing excessive slag in the system. Like I mentioned before, we have to avoid adding silicon carbide at a late stage of processing because silicon carbides do have a lot of high temperature melting uh, percentage in it, which can just stay as inclusion, slag inclusion into the system. Uh, there can be many forms of irregular graphite structure in our castings. We are aware that in case of ductile iron, the one of the most important parameters is nodularity and nodule count. Nodularity is the roundness, the sphericity of the graphite nodules that we have. And nodule count is the total number of nodules that we have in the system. Of course, what we want is, is a very high number of nodules and also a very high percentage of uh, nodularity. But it is not always the case. We sometimes encounter defects like you see here, which we will uh, look at in detail during the presentation, which can cause uh, other problems inside the casting. So starting with the first uh, and the foremost, if we have a poor nodule count in the system. So poor nodule count means if you look at the photograph here, you can see a much higher nodule count. If you look at the photograph here, you see a very few bigger in size nodules. So these are the two same sections, but they have a much big difference in the number of nodules in the system. What are the causes? First and the foremost, when you have insufficient inoculation, uh, you do not create enough nucleating sites for the graphite to precipitate out. And when you do not create enough nucleating sites, you eventually uh, reduce the number of nodules in the system. And let me tell you one more thing, that when we have poor nodule count, it also means that we in general have a very poor nodularity. because Larger the nodule count means smaller the nodule size and smaller the nodule size means better is the tendency for the nodule to keep or hold its shape, the spherical shape. And thereby, as you keep reducing the count, you keep increasing the graphite present in one of the nodules and thereby it becomes very difficult for those, those nodules to hold its shape of a sphere. 
because you know the if you look at the micro level inside the metal there are so many turbulent and dynamic actions happening there is metal or uh, all around this nodule which is trying to push it you know deform it or change its shape and smaller the nodule more easy it is for it to hold its shape as it keeps going growing bigger which happens in case of poor nodule count it tries to deform and change its shape so in many cases the problem of poor nodularity can also be solved by increasing the nodule count so you know inoculation we sometimes see that i can uh, sometimes say that i use the best quality of fsm and i will use a not so good quality inoculant and i'll get a good casting but in many cases it is actually the good quality inoculant which provides you sufficient nodule count which in turn gives you a better nodularity so the nodularity and nodule count both factors are interdependent on each other and we cannot address one and let the other take care of itself so when we are using a good quality inoculant when we are using a good quality uh, nodulizer we can think or expect to get a good nodule count and nodularity one of the causes like i mentioned for poor nodule count is the insufficient inoculation uh, superheat and excessive holding time so when you have a much higher uh, superheat in that case you would get a poor uh, uh, not graphitization and thereby a poor nodule count you can have excessive magnesium content magnesium is a anti graphitizer we all should be knowing that so higher the magnesium better it is is not the case you should have lowest possible magnesium and best possible nodularity any excessive magnesium is a strong carbide promoter and a strong anti graphitizer and therefore if you have a higher magnesium content you will get a poor nodule count and of course if you do not have sufficient re means you do you are you are not able to take care of the trace elements which are again anti graphitizers and that is why you get a poor nodule count possible cures can be just to take care of all these four you improve the inoculation you avoid superheating you make sure that you are able to cast in sub in in controlled time you do not have a very long pouring time you improve the base iron uh, nucleation that is by preconditioning or and you also avoid excessive magnesium coming into the system you do not want very high magnesium in the system i'll just give you this is just one of the examples that when we have the same kind of casting when we have the same kind of uh, uh, of of solidification rate Uh, if you use a barium calcium inoculant, uh, you would get a comparatively lesser nodule count. I'm not saying saying that the barium calcium calcium inoculant is not a good inoculant, but then it has its own limitations. So uh, in in this case, in this particular uh, case study, we had seen that when we were using a barium calcium based inoculant, we are getting a much poorer nodule count, and thereby also we are having a higher shrinkage tendency. on the other hand of it when we used to use the ultra seed based inoculant to produce the same kind of casting at at a same addition rate we got a much higher nodule count and we were able to thereby also control the shrinkage tendency in the casting so this is just to uh, you know reinstate the role of inoculation both on the improvement of nodule count as well as the control of shrinkage the next kind of graphite is again exploded graphite why does exploded graphite happen so so if you look at why does why is it called exploded graphite because if you look at these graphite nodules they were actually nodules but then it somehow appears that they just exploded and they broke into this is the extreme form of it where the uh, nodule broke into so many uh, different directions and these are again the graph nodules which are about to break out and these are the ones which have still not broken out so that is uh, the exploded graphite why do you have exploded graphite structure when you have a very high amount of carbon equivalent means your graphite nodules are big and they are not able to retain its shape if you look at it here interestingly all the graphite nodules which have exploded are large in size compared to the small ones meaning that as the as the graphite becomes bigger the tendency for explosion becomes higher meaning that when we are when we are having a higher carbon equivalent means higher carbon and higher silicon we often see this kind of a defect it is also connected to flotation so when you have more of carbon coming out you would have some amount of flotation happening uh, one of the elements which does support uh, exploded and chunky graphites is rare earth so when you have a high rare earth content especially for the heavy section or a slow solidifying section there is a strong tendency of exploded graphite happening how do you control it 
we control it by reducing the carbon equivalent by 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 taking the carbon equivalent which is most suited to the particular casting geometry and not go by a single carbon equivalent for all types of casting so we have to modify change adjust our carbon equivalent for the kind of casting that we are manufacturing not just going by the grade of the casting we have to increase the rate of solidification and we have to reduce the rare earth content in our nodigizer or reduce the addition rate so what does this tell us this tell us that as we go heavy on the sections of the casting we should try to reduce the rare earth coming into our system means when i am producing a heavy section i would try and achieve uh, try and go for a less rare earth containing ferrosilicon magnesium and as i am going towards the thin section casting i can increase the rare earth because high rare earth and heavy section is not a good combination so we have to always try to go for a lower rare earth how do you go for a lower rare earth by controlling your tray segments because why do you need a rare earth to control the tray segments so if you do not have a uh, high amount of tray segments you do not need excess amount of rare earth and then you can produce castings without having exploded or chunky graphite in the system chunky graphite is again uh, a continuum of uh, exploded graphite here you have uh, the graphites which are which are more in the form of you know small chunks and they are not present as actual graphite these are really very beautiful microstructures or the photograph of actual chunky graphite which can be which is quite rare i'm not sure how many of you had seen this before but this is exactly how a chunky graphite looks like or your tactic cell with chunky graphite in it looks like where do you get uh, why do you get this you get this when you have excess rare earth again the same uh, uh, reason uh, but in this case uh, in case of excluded it is uh, it can also happen when you have high uh, carbon equivalent but in in case of chunky graphite you it you get this when you have high carbon equivalent along with high percentage of rare earth in the system so these this is uh, and in fact for chunky graphite you don't even have to cut and check the micro even on the surface you can see some amount of blackish darkish more in that more like graphite flotation which is visible even uh, chunky graphite is visible just from the from the cut section and you don't need to actually uh, can you go back to previous slide please yeah Do you have a question or? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, so this is this is the chunky graphite uh, which can be visible from at in the cut section. So when you when you when you section a casting, you can actually see these dark kind of structures, uh, which are uh, which sometimes can also be graphite flotation, but even the chunky graphite appears to be like this. <laughs> Yes, yeah, thank you. This is the micro view. So that was the macro view when you look at the casting surface without polishing it. And this is the micro view. This is how the chunky graphite appears. What does this chunky graphite do? Uh, most importantly, the chunky graphite reduces the mechanical properties. So especially for the ductile iron, when you actually need a, a high uh, mechanical strength, tensile strength, uh, a presence of chunky graphite reduces the tensile strength substantially. So we need to make sure that we control the chunky graphite. The next one, I'm, I'm trying to give you uh, examples which are more in a continuum. So, you know, you, we saw exploded graphite, we saw chunky graphite, and then uh, the third one is graphite flotation. The cause for all these three kinds of graphite structures are mostly the same. The most common aspect is the high carbon equivalent, especially the carbon content in the casting so when you have a higher carbon equivalent for the given section you can get excluded you can get chunky you can also have graphite flotation issues so when you have uh, uh, for for especially for a heavy section when you have a higher carbon equivalent you would get a very uh, strong segregation of graphite towards the top and that's why it's called flotation it appears as if the carbon has floated towards the top of it and this happens when you have a much higher carbon equivalent, when you have a much higher temperature, uh, pouring tapping temperature, and when you have a very slow solidification rate, which is giving it enough time for the carbon to float up. This uh, kind of a defect is common 
in most cases only for the heavy section castings where the rate of solidification is slow and the amount of time for the carbon to come out or precip or float up is higher how do you control it you control it one by controlling the carbon equivalent that is uh, most important and then you can also control it by increasing the rate of uh, solidification providing chills etc and thereby also if you are able to improve the graphitization potential so that you are able to trap the carbon at different locations which can be done by improving the inoculation that could be one of the ways to uh, control the graphite flotation problems again the next one big nodule cluster this again is a continuum you know i this is also a problem which is caused by high carbon equivalent for a given section and poor inoculation. So when you have a high carbon equivalent, when you have a poor carbon, carbon equivalent, uh, if you look at this particular photograph, so this gives you the actual way how the casting solidification happens. So this is the dendrite, right? We have seen this. This is the dendrite. And then towards the sides of dendrite, you have graphite being precipitated out. So when you have excessive graphite inside the dendrite, and this mostly happens in the hot zones or the heavy sections of the casting, the casting which is last to solidify towards that region, when you have too much of graphite precipitating in one or two locations within the casting, the nodules try to agglomerate, the nodules try to combine with each other to get a much better thermal stability and thereby keep getting bigger in size and when they keep getting bigger in size, they appear to be something like this. It is a phenomena which is very similar to flotation, but here it does not get sufficient time or pathway to go to the top or float to the top, and it gets trapped between the dendritic arms or the secondary dendritic arms. So thereby it gets segregated in some of the parts within the casting. So you can see it here. You can see it here. You can see it here. So this is this is again a large casting problem. It's it happens mostly in the heavy section castings. And how do you solve it? One, like every other problem, we solve it by getting a much better carbon equivalent by reducing the pouring time, thereby not giving pouring temperature, thereby not giving it enough time and heat for the segregation. You increase the rate of cooling, and of course, if you are better in terms of inoculation you'll be better in terms of graphite precipitation you will not have a lot of dendritic growth and thereby you avoid this kind of a phenomena where the graphite gets trapped within the uh, dendritic dendritic arms so that can be one of the solutions nodule alignment again this is this is again related to undercooling in case of uh, ductile iron in case of gray iron we have seen type d and e microstructure why does it happen? Because you have a lot of dendrites growing and thereby the graphite flakes happen around the uh, uh, on the sides of it. In case of ductile iron also, when you have too much of undercooling happening, then you have a lot of dendrite, dendritic arms growing and then you see this graphite precipitating towards the side of it and thereby you get nodule alignment kind of a structure. So this is basically, if, if you look at this photograph, you can actually see the graphite, you cannot see the dendritic arms but you can see some amount of graphite precipitation around it. How do you solve it? The one of the most common ways to solve it is by improving the inoculation. So if you are able to improve inoculation, you restrict directional solidification. You does, do not allow graphite uh, the graphite uh, to precipitate next to the dendrites. You do not allow dendritic arms to be very long and uh, uh, allowing for the graphite pre precipitation on its sides. And how do you do that? We do that one by better inoculation and two by ensuring that you do not have trace elements which are which are uh, deleterious to graphitization. So these can be some of the ways to control or reduce nodule alignment. So if you look at it here, so this is a much better explanation of how nodule alignment happens. So you see dendritic arms and you see uh, graphites. You see these dendritic arms and then you see graphite precipitating around it on the sides of it, and that is why the nodule appear to be more aligned, but it is not actually nodule. It is the graphite. Uh, it's it's not actually the nodule. It is a dendrite which is growing and because of which the nodules do not have any other space other than the sides of it to uh, precipitate out. Spiky graphite again, spiky graphite is something which is uh, which can happen uh, in case of both gray and ductile in gray. It is kind of Widman statin, but in case of ductile, these spiky graphites happen when you have a lot of anti-nodulizers. 
like bismuth, antimony, and lead, when they are present in excess, they can cause uh, the graphite structure to be uh, not a sphere, but more having spikes, more like having spikes. And that is the spiky graphite that we see in our casting. And that is something which can only be controlled by having a control on these kind of tramp trace elements in our system. How do you how do you control it? Like I mentioned, we have to reduce the amount of triumph elements such as lead, bismuth, and antimony. Uh, where does these come from? These come from painted scraps. So, so especially the steel scrap, which uh, which has uh, coating uh, paint, which which contains lead. Uh, we may also need to avoid bismuth containing inoculants because bismuth is an anti nodulizer So, uh, bismuth containing inoculants can be or should be avoided in most cases unless it is mandatory so that you do not have bismuth in coming into your system, thereby, uh, you know, disturbing the nodularity of it. And also increase the rare earth additions. So this is like the counter. So when you increase the rare earth content, like, like cerium and lanthanum, we are able to uh, use these elements to trap uh, the trace elements like lead and bismuth, thereby the impact of these triumph elements gets reduced. So, so uh, there are foundries which, when they do not use a very good quality scrap, they have to use a higher rare earth containing uh, uh, treatment device to make sure that you do not have the negative impact of these tramp elements affecting or disturbing your metal. Flake graphite structure on the surface, uh, casting surface, especially uh, ductile iron. We see a lot of uh, ductile iron castings having graphite flakes on the surface despite the inner part of the casting being very good in terms of nodularity. Why does it happen? It happens because of the interaction between the metal and the mold, the mold which has got higher sulfur content in it. It can also happen when you have a much longer running system because then you have a lot of uh, sand sulfur coming into the system. It can happen when you have a higher pouring temperature. How do you control it? You control by uh, making sure that your sulfur content in the sand is within control by increasing the magnesium percentage thereby which means by increasing the addition rate of ferrocilic and magnesium by controlling the temperature and the uh, time that we take for uh, metal tapping metal pouring and the transfers and lastly by using a rare earth containing inoculant this rare earth containing inoculant this is something which we have seen in the past that when we get a surface flake uh, kind of a defect in case of ductile iron we generally tend to use a cerium based inoculant which helps con uh, which helps control this uh, flake reversal and then it does not allow the graphite flakes to form on the surface of the casting. But then what, uh, will, just... be the, what, what will be the optimum uh, magnesium by sulfur ratio uh, for this? Uh, you said the remedy is to increase magnesium by sulfur ratio. Yeah. So what uh -huh. I'm trying to say here is that sir, you have to uh, you have to have sulfur in the in, in your metal. So the optimum sulfur in the system should be 0 0.01 as such and the optimum magnesium in the sulfur uh, 0 0.01 sorry uh, sulfur in the system and then the optimum magnesium should be 0 0.03 so so one is to three if you have magnesium and sulfur i'm giving you a thumb rule this is not something which can be directly implemented everywhere but uh, if you have a like say why i'm telling you a ratio is because if you have high magnesium and low sulfur it is not good okay. and if you have high sulfur and less magnesium that is also not good so we have to combine our magnesium and sulfur to see how much is my base sulfur how much is my final sulfur and then how much magnesium do i actually need to make sure that i get graphites at the same time i do not get flakes so that is why it is important to okay. uh, adjust and choose your final magnesium and final sulfur in such a manner that you get a uh, good quality uh, combination and a good quality graphite uh, nodules even on the surface. It shall be, it shall be more than three. Okay, correct. If I'm right, it shall be more uh, than three. Yeah, generally yes. Okay. But but like say um, for example, if you are having uh, say 0 0.02 sulfur, you cannot have 0 0.06 magnesium. So in that case, this thumb rule yeah, does yeah, not apply. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so, yeah. so if you have a control on, you have to have a control on both magnesium and sulfur. But generally speaking, if your sulfur is in the range of 0.01 to 0.15, your magnesium should be in the range of 0.03 to 0.45. So that's the that's the okay. general way of looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess this is the last or probably the second last part uh, defect primary carbide. So primary carbide tendency again, this is something which is very common and very 
much of a uh, of a worry for our found for for our foundries we have a lot of carbide forming tendency in our casting and why does it happen especially in the ductile iron because we have magnesium and magnesium is a very strong carbide promoter so although magnesium is a friend to us because we want it for nodularity it if present in excess can also be a enemy to us because then it will form carbides it can give you shrinkage so what are we trying to say here is that we have to make sure that our carbon uh, comes out as graphite and does not go back and combine with iron to form fe3c which is cementite or iron carbide the presence of these carbides which are very hard phases does have a obvious consequence on the mechanical properties as well as the machinability of the casting so when what i'm trying to say here is that if you look at it this is a temperature versus time thermal graph so when the solidification happens you want the carbon to start precipitating somehow at a higher temperature that is the eutectic temperature so if the carbon does not precipitate at a higher temperature it goes much lower less than the white line and that is where you have carbides or cementite precipitating so that is why some of you who are familiar with the thermal analysis must be seeing that we always try to insist on a higher lower eutectic temperature because if the lower eutectic temperature is high it means you do not cross this white line thereby you do not form primary cementites or primary carbides you actually form graphites and then go towards the end of solidification what are the causes for these primary carbides one of the causes is thin section and fast solidification means you do not give enough time for the carbon to come out as graphite when you have a very poor carbon equivalent or the silicon contents it means you do not have enough graphitizers when you have a very high magnesium percentage it means that it can give you carbides when you have a very high percentage of carbide promoting trace elements like chromium vanadium molybdenum etc it can give you uh, excessive carbide when you do not have sufficient amount of inoculation meaning you you are not allowing for enough uh, nucleating sites to uh, grow or develop then you will have a lot of carbides we have we have most of the foundries using ce meters and in case of ce meters we use those white tellurium containing cups please make sure that those cups or the metal which come which is present in the cup does not go back into your furnace because these 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 cups contain tellurium at the bottom of it you would have seen that white colored patch and this tellurium is a very strong carbide promoter so when you have this kind of a uh, of course many of you must be having this kind of a equipment please make sure and ensure that these small part of metal which is about i don't know about 200 to 5300 grams they should not not go back into your furnace because they are are a very strong source of tellurium which is again a very strong source of uh, carbides possible cures we have to uh, make sure that our carbon equivalent and our silicon is uh, is decided selected in a most suitable manner such that it is good enough to give you graphites we have to have a control on magnesium and other trace elements we have to ensure that our metal has got a very good nucleating potential which can come from better inoculants which can come from better preconditioning which can come from a very good base iron say for example use of pig irons or or good graphitizers or or you know uh, having a control on the quality of uh, other charge materials that we have like say for example we do not want any trace elements coming into the system of course we have to avoid tellurium cups uh, to go back into the furnace and we have to uh, make sure our temperature is optimum for this kind of a uh, for the kind of casting that you are manufacturing of course a uh, good inoculation is one of the most powerful weapon against the chill you can see it here we have seen uh, uh, cases instances where a high potent inoculant is able to control the carbide in the chill forming tendency compared to a low potent uh, barium calcium or a calcium based ferrocilicon based inoculant which has got which is giving you uh, carbides the other aspect of it we talked about the fast solidification we talked about the initial primary carbides but the other aspect of it is that the carbon or the carbides does not emerge only during the fast solidification or the initial stage in fact in case of heavy section castings the casting which has got a much slower solidification rate these carbon uh, these carbides can also be found towards the last to solidify the end of freezing zone towards the center or the core of the casting and why does it happen there because of two major reasons all these elements are low melting elements like manganese and chromium and vanadium etc uh, so these elements do have a tendency to segregate towards the last 
freezing zone. And when these elements segregate towards the last freezing zone, they do cause some amount of carbides to form. We usually do not find these kind of carbides, but suppose if you have a casting where you are doing a through hole, where you have to go through the core of the casting, drill through the core of the casting, we sometimes encounter that my tool life becomes poor when I'm doing a through hole. And why does it happen? Because the tool or the drill is encountering the hard phases towards the center of the casting. And these are called inverse carbides, intercellular iron carbides, which are present towards the center of the casting. The other reason for this kind of a defect is also when you have a not a, a inoculant which fades over time. So when you have an inoculant which fades uh, during the solidification, then when the end of solidification comes, at that time you do not have enough graphitization potential left in your metal. And when you do not have enough graphitization potential left in the metal, this metal will in turn cause uh, this metal will in turn be a home for carbide promotion. And thereby, whatever carbon is present, instead of combining and forming as graphite, it will combine with iron to form iron carbide, which is called inverse carbide, inverse chill, or intercellular iron carbides. A good inoculation that generates a high nodule density will minimize the segregation of these uh, carbide promoting elements and also make sure that there is enough graphitization potential towards the end of solidification and thereby you do get a intercellular carbide free structure inside the casting. So to conclude the last slide, each defect does come with an opportunity for improvement most important aspect for casting defect resolution is the correct identification of the defect. So we sometimes think that the problem is something else and find a solution, but eventually we later we find out that the solution that we are trying to take was not the not the correct one. Most defects can be resolved just by adjustments and slight improvement in the process parameters. Like I've said, we do look at fancy or uh, you know critical and uh, tedious methods or ways to solve a problem, but sometimes it is just small adjustments or improvements in the process which can give you the results instead of going for you know uh, advanced techniques and uh, expensive solutions for a problem. Only a few defects do need advanced techniques and treatments for the resolution. Of course, that's what uh, that's why we have those advanced techniques for to resolve problems when they are not possible to be solved using the basic processes. So if a defect occurs. A good foundryman spends majority of the time identifying the actual root cause and then the solution finding exercise becomes simpler and efficient. So with this, I end my presentation. I thank IF uh, Southern Region and Chennai chapter for giving me the opportunity to uh, make this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. A very, very extensive and fantastic presentation. So uh, gentlemen, you are, the floor is now open for questions. Yeah, can I ask the question? Yeah, please. Yes. Yeah, my name is Kupa. See, uh, uh, hi, Krishna. Hi, hi yes. Kumar. Kumar, how are you? This is Shugopal from Alam uh, I have got a question. That is where uh, most of the companies. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. See, I, the question is uh, uh, one of the foundries in, uh, is using cupola and making cast iron uh, castings. And they want to achieve uh, a type benefit, and uh, they are making use of uh, only cupola, and they don't have. They do have a uh, induction furnace, but when they are using a uh, induction route, uh, they are getting a type graphite no problem by making uh, use of uh, good quality inoculants from Elkem and others. But when they are making use of this cupola iron, grey iron, grey cast iron, they are not getting a type graphite. Do you have anything to suggest so that uh, I can pass on that? And uh, I will definitely say it's the suggestion for me. Thanks. Yeah, it's a thank you for the question, sir. But it's it's kind it's kind of a uh, I would say insufficient uh, information for me to tell you how do we solve that problem. Of course, we know in general that Cupola does have a much better nucleating potential compared to induction furnaces, uh, primarily because of the sulfur content and the inherent, uh, you know, uh, it's more virgin material with inherent nucleating potential compared to a remelted in induction uh, yes. process. Uh, but if yeah. they are able to achieve a good model, a good uh, graphitization using induction and not using cupola, maybe it has got something to do with the kind of 
uh, traces with trace segments which comes in with the pig iron and you know the other charged materials which they have which needs to look at i would suggest the foundry to look at the chemical composition especially the trace segments which comes in from the raw materials or the charged materials of the cupola and then uh, maybe once we look at it we can give a much better recommendation so uh, yeah. yeah so that should be the way out inoculation as such uh, may not be a solution here the solution should be more to look at the base iron and see what are the trace uh, element levels in the cupola metal that they have yeah because this is the scenario most prevalent in indian context yeah. because uh, accepting the automotive foundries wherein uh, they are going for all kinds of automation and whatever you have suggested to eliminate the defects they will all implement but normal uh, foundries they go for either cupola or cupola or cupola duplex root only that was the uh, typical defect i could not uh, uh, completely give a solution i thought of asking anyway thanks for the update and uh, thanks for the enlightenment thank you very much welcome uh, i have a question on inoculant hello sir can you may hear? please introduce yourself and you can also say your organization's name and then the yeah. question may be asked please yeah. i am tapun roy i am from pendrol rahi precision industries west bengal Yes, so yes, my sir. question is on inoculant as you told that the ultra seed based inoculant is suitable uh, so uh, i would like to know the apart from the uh, silicon what are the other elements like you mentioned the barium and calcium in other form of inoculant so in ultra seed what are the other elements present apart from ferro silicon uh, ultra seed ultra seed is uh, we have we have three types of i mean i'm talking about alkum sir in alkum we have three types of ultra seed family inoculants one of it is cerium based the other is zirconium based and then there is a bismuth based and ultra seed inoculants are actually uh, these are the inoculating elements ferrosilicon is just a carrier just to uh, uh, yeah. uh, you this ferrosilicon in any case in any inoculant ferrosilicon is just a carrier so ferrosilicon itself does not act as a inoculant it is the inoculating element which is present in it which acts as a inoculant so any foundry who is using ferrosilicon as a inoculant is actually getting the benefits because of the calcium and the aluminum which is present in it so 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 any inoculant would have ferrosilicon plus the inoculating element so these ultra seed like you have asked it can be zip, uh, it can be zirconium based it can be cerium based it can be bismuth based and each of these inoculant has got their own specific needs and applications for the kind of casting that we are manufacturing and we can suggest based on the casting that is being manufactured on what type of there are more than 20 types of inoculants with different elements and different combinations that we have but then each one can be dependent on uh, each one can be you know uh, suggested based on the type of requirement that you have in the foundry okay oh, thank you very much yeah. uh kumar uh, could you hear me yes sir yeah kumar uh, really uh, uh, first of all i want to thank you it's a uh, good presentation today and this is prakash from pt castings okay yes sir uh, we are finding a defect after machining in a particular grade 400 by 18 it's a defect is like a small white shade variation in the casting surface uh, it's a chunky castings only but we yes. are not able to find out a root cause for that uh, white shade variation what could be probable root cause for that Um, i thought today the defect we might have covered but it's not there that's the reason i was what, asking what what you can do is sir i would suggest what you what we can do is that if you could send me a piece of that casting we could have a look at it uh, and then uh, i sir, to be very honest i usually avoid uh, giving solutions because uh, in many cases it is not it is not easy for me to you know uh, without getting all the details to give a solution because i do not want the solution to not work Right. No, I thought of so, I thought of that defect will be covered in this today's metallurgical part. That's what I, I was expecting. That I will try and take it up next time when we have. I'll add it, add on to it. If you want us to help you with that or work together with you on that, my request is that if you could contact Shankar or somebody, uh, send sure. some samples to us. We can analyze. We can give you a detailed report on what it is and what can be the possible way of solving it. Sure, sure. I my my suggestion would be that we can take it offline. Uh, uh, and then uh, maybe go cut it in detail and then try to find a solution right sorry Thank sorry you. sorry for not covering yeah, it yeah no issue no issue we will yeah. we'll take it next time yeah yeah any further questions gentlemen hello sir this is somshekar from calling from nitech forecasting shumoga yeah yes, yes sir, sir. 
sir in the ppt you have suggested uh, that silicon carbide addition it should be it should be avoided yeah but uh, some man, uh, some of the technical persons are they suggested to add the silicon carbide in the metal to improve the uh, means nucleation and other thing what will yeah. be the uh, effect on or it should be added end of the melting or start of the melting how how it will be then what is your uh, suggestion sir yes sir so to uh... to speak on silicon carbide actually the silicon carbide that we use the metallurgical grade that we use in the foundry is only about 85% pure that is 85% of silicon and carbide uh, the rest 15% in general is impurities impurities which are high temperature melting impurities which does not dissolve in our normal foundry conditions of 1550 1600 1450 like that at that temperature so it will always stay as a undissolved uh, part in the system so when you are adding silicon carbide in the beginning in the furnace as a source of silicon at that time because from the silicon we do have slag removal processes the the excessive uh, the extra in uh, the extra non dissolved impurity that comes from the silicon carbide can be removed from during the slag removal process and the good things that you get out of it you will get it in the metal but when you are adding silicon carbide towards the end of solidification uh, towards the sorry towards the end of uh, just before tapping or just before you know casting there is a strong possibility that this 15 20% of impurity that you have in silicon carbide will not completely get removed and thereby this can go into your system and cause inclusions so that is the reason why we we have not uh, i did not say that we should not use it i just said that we should not add it towards the end if at all there is some silicon carbide addition has to be done it should be added in the beginning along with the charge and not towards the end of it for adjusting the silicon or the carbon let's not try and use this as a uh, silicon adjuster or let's not try and use it as a preconditioner because it is not a preconditioner so so that is why uh, my suggestion was that we should try if we have to use we should use it in the beginning so that whatever slag or whatever inclusion is there it let us pray to god that it floats up and we are able to remove it because there is a strong tendency for any silicon carbide user that they will get inclusion in the casting so if you ask me should i use it i would say no but still if you have to use it use it in the beginning and not towards the end okay thank you yeah. sir one more question is there yeah uh, normally after machining uh, if it is a very thick casting we are uh, finding some white patches like uh, after machining there is a different color means blackish color after you go for final machining some of the customer uh, they they don't want to accept because uh, functionally if you check it an harness will not get any harness maybe harness may be uh, 180 to 200 we check on particular area harness may be 120 130 if we cut the casting and see the micros it is a completely flaky what will be the reason and if same casting we, we use it on press sand or co2 we will get the uh, correct quality of the means uh, casting quality we will get all that any Uh, possibility to correct in uh, nodulizing or inagland will get we can avoid this type of defect uh you we can do it we'll have to look at what is the what is the uh, micro uh, i mean if you could send me some micro structures i i i'll be in a much better position to give you a solution to it uh we can definitely get in touch and try and see how we can solve it whether it is related to flotation or whether it is related to nodule reversal we have to see Uh, it could be one of the two because you are saying it's a heavy section casting, so it could be that. But I will be able to just give you a much better uh, suggestion, sir, or we can discuss it in a much better way if we are able to have some more details of the casting. Okay, in a particular way, it's a flake. If we go for adjacent side, we will get the nodules. Uh, this is the case. We have studied that. Okay. 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 Uh, which place are you from, sir? Sir, show me again. I take for a cause. It is belong to Shankara group. Okay, so in that case, I guess Shankar is the one who who you must be interacting yeah, I, with. Yeah, I know the Shankar sir. Let's let's uh, take it up with Shankar myself and you uh, maybe offline, uh, and then we can find a we can find a way to you know look at the problem, understand it better, and then get a solution for it. Okay. Yeah. Thank Any further questions, gentlemen? You can either put it in the chat box or you can ask the question by unmuting yourself. 
Uh, please share the presentation also, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, this yeah. So, Kumar, you'll be able to share the presentation. Uh, it will be a bit difficult, but I guess we have. Do we have we recorded it for the YouTube? If yeah, maybe. that is what I was going to come to. I have recorded it, so I can share it by YouTube, sir. So we can always refer to it uh, because uh, sometimes it becomes a bit difficult. We do have some confidential Correct. information which we do not want to be, you know, represented somewhere. Uh, so that's why it will be a bit difficult for me. But I guess I am always available for anything that you want, and uh, we can always take yeah. it uh, on on one, sir. Yes. All right. So, any further questions, or if there are no further questions, I think we'll move on with uh, the vote of thanks. Yeah. Hello. So, uh, gentlemen, anything further? Sorry. Okay. So, gentlemen, we have had a very uh, interesting uh, webinar today on the topic causes and cures for. Uh, Typical metallurgical def uh, defects in gray and ductile cast iron. So we are sure the contents of the presentation had a excellent takeaways for our audience. So we'd like to thank our speaker for the day, Mr. Kumar Kisle, Head Research and Innovation, Elkem, for taking time off his busy schedule and for making us rich with knowledge. Further, we'd like to thank all the members who joined us on time for this uh, technical talk. I'm sure you all had a wonderful learning experience. And uh, a, a big thanks that uh, we almost reached around uh, 75 uh, attendees today and uh, thanks so much for your uh, support so we from the chennai chapter will be conducting many such uh, uh, interesting programs both uh, physical and virtual and we'll be sharing information with you on the same looking forward to your support for all our future programs thank you so much thanks thank you thank you and special thanks to mr kumar thank you so much most welcome thank you so much for time and uh, thanks you. also to mr shankar